Let's do this. Y'all welcome Brandon Roberts to the stage. All right. Thank, thank you for that uh, wonderful, well, I guess I got, got, just got to stand up here, wonderful introduction. And we got to see we got some people hyped in the crowd here. Shout out to Mark. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, the guy, she gave me an intro. This is an uh, open source uh, instead of outsource your uh, database. So a talk that I've uh, wanted to give and ha ha have had some fun with. So uh, we can get right into it. Hey, you see my face? You know, don't worry about the, the name on two lines there. We got we to roll with it. But I'm Brandon. You can follow me on Twitter, Brandon T. Roberts. You see the, the T on the, in the middle there, so make sure we get that. Uh, I am, like you said, a maintainer on the uh, NGRX project, which is a set of reactive libraries for Angular apps. I know we got some, no, we probably got a good crew of React folks in here, but we got some Angular representatives in here as well. Let's go. Uh, Google Developer Expert. It just means I've been around the community for a while and contributed some things and uh, get to do some uh, get to do some more things as a as a part of that. So I'm also a, a developer experience engineer at AppRight, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit uh, more also. Uh, so for the agenda uh, for this talk, um, we're talking about open source and uh, choosing your stack and kind of the decisions you go into uh, with that. Uh, we'll talk about outsourcing your database and the decisions there. Uh, open sourcing, uh, whether you choose an open source option there. Uh, we'll also talk about REST APIs, and I'll give a quick overview of that. And we'll uh, give a mention about uh, AppRite, as I mentioned there, place I work, so pretty cool there. So choosing your stack. Go there. So there's many different, of course, there's many different ways when you're thinking about building products that you can, uh, different stacks you can choose, uh, whether it be a front end, web app, which we'll probably see more talks about that during the conference, a mobile app, I also have a desktop app, or a back end app. So these are just some of the different ways, uh, what different products you can build, of course, depending on what your stack is. So for front-end applications, you have, a, you have plenty of choices here as far as the web frameworks go. I mentioned here, Angular, we like, we like Angular. I mentioned some of the other ones also. If you're, if you're in this space, uh, React. Uh, we got Vue, we got uh, Svelte. I see we got one person in the back for Svelte, great. <laughs> no, no slight there, I like, I like Svelte also. Well, of course, we got others there, so you get to choose your, your uh, stack there. Uh, for mobile apps, we got native development, which use Android, uh, Java, which use Java and Kotlin. Uh, we got uh, iOS, which you have Swift and Objective-C there. We got to do, do the switching on the fly here. Uh, we also have hybrid apps, and I'm kind of leading up here, so we'll go, we'll kind of talk about some of these different areas and then see where we're leading up to. But hybrid apps, Flutter, we got Ionic in here and uh, native script. If you choose that as your stack, we got PWAs, whether you want kind of a more of a hybrid approach there, and also others in that area. Uh, also, desktop apps. Uh, we got .NET Framework. Like I said, many choices here Electron, uh, Java, if I'm going too fast here, Ionic and React Native there. Uh, and also uh, back-end frameworks. Node, Express, uh, Fastify, and Express is like a pretty low-level routing library for Node.js, and Fastify is a, a library that's built on top of, uh, inspired by Express, and there's also Nest.js, which is also has support for Express and Fastify there. So continuing with back-end frameworks, uh, we got PHP, I've done PHP in the past. We got uh, Laravel, so these are just some of the ways you can build with that. Symphony, I don't know if we got any old school PHP people in here that have used some of these. Also have Code Igniter. Uh, if you're into Python, of course there's many choices there. Django and Flask. 
.NET Core, got ASP and uh, C Sharp. So like I mentioned, the main uh, point of this talk is databases. So if we look at open source databases, we've got MySQL, uh, MariaDB, uh, MongoDB is another, or MySQL is probably the most recognized open source database, and MariaDB is a spinoff of that, and then we have Mongo, DB, which is a uh, NoSQL, and Postgres, which is another relational database, and others like CockroachDB, and there's uh, the list, like I said, the list goes on and on and on. So, I know that was a long list, but I listed those, I listed those options just to say there are many options you have to choose from when you want to get an idea off the ground. But the good news is, is all these options are open source, and so there's no shortage of choice available to, to use any of these uh, particular solutions. So going back to database, where do you want to choose where you choose to outsourcing versus uh, open source your database, or going with a self-hosted solution, or rolling your own? So outsourcing versus open sourcing. We have some decision factors there, which I'll talk about uh, pros and cons when making these particular choices on which stack you want to use. So decision factors. Some of the decision factors are just the time it takes to build an app, uh, whether depending on how many resources, and resources also factor into it also, team size, and these, all these things could have uh, many different impacts on, on your, what the speed at which you want to build. Also, there's custom business, lo business logic and factors into what you choose. If we zoom out a little bit, there may be strict regulations on which providers you can use, whether you lean more towards open source or a hosted provider that's, uh, that you can kind of ship your data off to there. There's also uh, ownership and mobility, so this also may be important in that case. Like I said, privacy and privacy laws are a big uh, factor there, where they have some place, like I said, have things in place where you can, you're restricted on what type of software you can use because they want to lean toward, more towards open source. And of course, money is a factor there also, because you, if you go with a provider that you, uh, that's hosted already, then you're kind of making a trade-off there of having to pay them versus uh, pay them versus hosting it yourself. So outsourcing. Uh, for outsourcing, I'll talk about the kind of what the meaning of that is, pros and cons of, of this approach. So outsourcing. So what does it mean? It means it's usually service-based. It means you choose some provider that you're not, you don't have control over there, uh, that you're saying, we want to use this, we want to basically roll on top of this uh, stack there. So it could mean that the provider is, uses open, some providers use open source, but they, you know, they've built, they have the, the secret sauce, as you would say, uh, that's closed source that you don't have access to. Uh, it's also hosted access to where, like I said, they, they maintain the servers, uh, they have all the infrastructure there, and it's also privileged access, so you don't, you don't know what else, necessarily know what else is running uh, on those servers. So there are some pros to this approach. Uh, one of those being ramp up time. Uh, they give you, like I said, you don't have to rebuild the thing uh, on your own, so you have that going for you there. Uh, they're sometimes owned by larger companies that have a lot of resources and money, resources and money to be able to scale up in to scale up in this way, and like I said, the amount of scale that they can provide is is something that you can get from from outsourcing. They also, give you abstractions that let you integrate with your your stack of choice, uh, whether it be like I said, web, mobile, or other. And there's also the managed data aspect where it comes to maintenance, where they upgrade and you you sort of get those upgrades along the way. Those things are kind of handled for you. So there's also some cons to this approach. One con could be that it is, again, owned by a large company. So they, you're, 
you're a, you, may, you may be a, a small fish in a large lake, or if, <laughs> that's how the saying goes. It also could be harder to pivot. So if you want to move off of uh, software that's owned by a large corporation, you're kind of hooked in there, and there may be some drawback to that. Uh, there's also cost. There could be a good bit of cost uh, involved in uh, how much, like I said, how much you pay, how much you depend on how you scale up, how the charging is charging goes. Also, tribal knowledge. Uh, you learn if you put all that into uh, that particular product, then you you have that knowledge of that product, and then it's not necessarily that easily portable to move to another uh, provider. You also lose some ownership of that that data. You, like I said, they have custom solutions, custom databases, custom stacks that you don't necessarily have. You can't see all the source, so that is a, a one thing to take in mind. And security, of course, because security is always a concern uh, because it's behind closed doors. You don't know exactly what what else is being done, or if if it's always secure, or how things. Because you, like I say, you just don't have access to it. Uh, next up, we'll talk about uh, the open source angle. So on the open source side, we'll, we'll go into this. We'll talk about the meaning of open source. If For those of you who may, may not be that familiar with it, uh, but of course we know that open source is eating a lot of the, the software world now, and we'll talk about the pros and the cons of that approach. So open... What does it mean to be, uh, have an open source project? It means openly available to use. Uh, it's also openly available to modify. So if you have, if you have a custom needs and you need a custom solution, you can take something that's already out there and modify it to your needs. There's also existing solutions out there. As I mentioned, lots of open source projects, uh, lots of, they give you flexibility in terms of what you want to do there. Also self-hosted or managed. So this means that you could run your, take this project, run it on your own infrastructure, and have it, you still have that uh, data there that's managed, but you have, like I said, access to it, and you kind of know more of what's going on there. So pros with this approach. As I mentioned, the source is available. Anybody can take, modify it. They can contribute back to the project. There's a bit of ownership there where you have the ownership of that data or the code that you know that you're deploying there. You can use to build on top of that. Big thing in the open source community is security. I know we've seen some uh, things on, you see some things online where open source projects have uh, maybe have been uh, abused this in some kind of way, but in general, open source projects are looked at by millions of developers because they want the project to be as, you know, as best and secure as possible. There's also the community aspect around it. The open source project gives you that like personal and professional interest in a project to make sure that, uh, that the project thrives and continue, con con continues to uh, go there. clicker here. Uh, there are also other pros to uh, op using open source. Uh, transferable technical knowledge. And this allows you, like I said, every, everybody can see the code, it's documented. If some people, other people on ramp on your team, you can transfer that knowledge to them a little more easily. Also cost flexible. If you have more like I say, you need more resources. You're not necessarily paying for the software. You can, let's say, if you're self-hosting, that gives you some flexibility there. And platform flexibility also to where, like I said, if you want to transfer away from a particular platform or host, let's say you're hosting on uh, DigitalOcean or Heroku, you can fr freely move between these different solutions there. So, cons of uh, choosing open source uh, project is self-assembly. There are projects, you know, like I said, you can clone it, you can build it yourself, you can ship it, but you, you're in charge of that. So you could end up 
you know, re-implementing that for each particular project. So there's that maintenance aspect there. Uh, also, some open source projects are, they're maintained by a few people. There may be one or two people that uh, help maintain that project and they're doing it in their spare, uh, free and spare time. So just take that into account. But I think the thing that, we want, that we're aiming for here is balance. Uh, so we want to have some of those, we want to have some aspects of that on each one. Because at the end of the day, we want, like I said, we want a little bit of both. And so that would be a good thing to have. So let's talk about the balance that we get uh, from choosing open source uh, choose an open source project versus um, the balance between outsourcing and open sourcing. Like I said, we want that ramp up time. We want to be able to build things quickly. We, want to, we still want that security, op that know that we're running secure option, secure software that's been vetted by millions of developers. We want it to be able to scale up and still be able to uh, scale up from one to one million or users, or how many ever users you have, you know, because you got, always got to start somewhere. So we want to be able to scale there. Also, we still want to have those uh, abstractions where we can build for our, whatever our project of choice is. And we want proven solutions that will help us uh, more quickly ship uh, applications there. Uh, continuing on with that, we still want the option to have managed uh, software to where we're not, you don't have much of a, as much of a maintenance cost there. Still have ownership of, ownership of the data to where, like I said, if you want to change your providers of where your database is hosted or move to a different solution, you still have access to all of that. Talked about the transferable technical knowledge. Uh, where anybody can, is, it could be a quicker on-ramp to your team to uh, be able to show them how, how you've implemented a particular solution that they've maybe seen before. And this is really prevalent in the, in the web frameworks as far as those being open source, where you can actually see what the code is doing and kind of get a deeper knowledge of what's going on there. I mentioned cost flexibility. If you choose to go to a cheaper provider that maybe works better for your project, and platform uh, flexibility there. Because at the end of the day, we still just want to ship code and ship products and get stuff out the door. Because uh, that's what we do as developers. Uh, so next up, I'll talk about uh, REST APIs. Because the REST API is, is the next part of like integration uh, with your primary interface to like your database. So we'll talk about what a REST API is, kind of the building blocks there, and features that uh, you would normally have with your REST API. So REST API, if you may have heard the term before, but it stands for representational state transfer. That's a mouthful. Uh, and I've practiced this a few times, so you can see how that goes. But uh, that just means that the, the server itself is uh, stateless, and it uh, processes each request like independently, so you don't have any uh, state between requests. And of course, API, I shouldn't say of course, API stands for Application Programming Interface. And you may have also heard this referred to as a RESTful API. So we're looking at the diagram here. The REST API is just a more of a bridge between the server and your clients, whether it be mobile, uh, web or desktop client there. So REST API is in charge of decoupling the client and server, so there's a handoff of data there. As I mentioned before, it's stateless, so the data is persisted across requests. It's layered in that it's built up from many smaller systems and uh, helps you to inc do incrementally like, add more features to that underneath. Uh, it's also uniform, so API requests for the same resource uh, should look the same there. So 
So some essentials that you need for a REST API, of course you'll need a server, uh, you need a language, uh, your, whatever your language of choice is. Uh, JavaScript is my primary language, so Node.js there. Like I mentioned, we talked about a lot of other stacks there. Uh, there are some common conventions for REST APIs that you use as far as like status codes, action methods, and more there. And of course the functionality uh, that you need to expose the information from your database or the other items that you need there. Going on with that, you have data abstraction, and this is most common being JSON data, to where you're exposing this data to the client through the REST API. Uh, authentication, which is something that's always tricky to get right, uh, but that's something that you would, if you're building something that, of course, with users, you want to definitely want to have a secure way to identify them. Also have storage, uh, whether it be files or media, and a common aspect of REST APIs is to connect to other systems. So I said all that to say that this is part of what, uh, like I said, open source, part of what AppRight does, uh, and that it's a self-hosted solution. So just looking at that, I just wanted to bring that up so as a solution there to, to mention here. So. AppRight is uh, an open source project. Uh, it is back in as a service. Uh, we'll give you the more of the, the quick elevator pitch here because we'll go through here. So it is self-hosted, uh, but there's a cloud-hosted version uh, coming soon there. Uh, so these kind of the things that, these balance and things that we're going to talk about here, REST APIs it has for that, and those core functionality as far as being a, uh, core functionality that you would need to build applications. So some of those uh, would be, here. Uh, kind of talked about database, authentication, like I said, all those things that you would need, storage uh, for media or files, cloud functions, uh, real-time events, and like I said, being able to target multiple platforms, is those are things that can make the process of development easier uh, in that way. So, this is the money shot, as we call it. And I'll wait, okay, everybody get out your laptops and just type this command and we'll just, we'll see, you gotta have Docker installed, so I guess I could've threw that in there first. But type this out and then you can get rough started with that, but I'm sure we're not gonna sit here and do that. But we gotta show the slide there, because like I said, at the end of the day, we're talking about balance, and we should have some spinning uh, here from Inception. We probably got a few Inception fans out here, so they will understand this reference. But as I mentioned before, uh, to recap, uh, I talked about uh, databases, or the, talked about building products, kind of decision factors that we have there as far as what stacks you want to go with, uh, whether you want to outsource with going with a hosted provider, or choose an open source solution. I uh, talked about REST APIs and gave a little preview of what uh, AppRite is about. But of course, you can find out more or you can come talk to me uh, after, after this talk and we can talk more about that. Thanks. All right, let's go. Roll with